welcome, welcome. My name is Ayaka, and I am a consultant with LSAT Unplugged. I'm focusing a lot on the admissions um, process for law school. Um, I've been with the LSAT Unplugged as a TA for about a year. Um, and in that year, um, I got really into um, going into applications, helping people write their essays, um, personal diversity, optional agenda, all of that fun stuff. And um, uh, I became a consultant in that. So um, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to kind of answer all of the questions that you may have. Um, glad to see so many people here show up um, on their Sunday. So uh, thank you all for taking the time to do that. I know it's uh, it's the weekend going into Thanksgiving, so we might be traveling or we have we might have plans with family, but uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, so today, I know in the email that Steve sent out, um, we were he was talking about how uh, this class can help you uh, customize your application. Um, for law school, which I think is really important. And it's the piece that people don't think about until maybe a couple weeks into kind of setting up their application. Um, so I really wanted to come in today and really talk about how we can do that um, in a way that is productive and in a way that is um, that meshes well with what you are trying to do with your application. So um, I'm going to do a little spiel in hopefully in about 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'll open the room up to questions. Feel free to um, either put your uh, questions in the chat or, you know, you, um, once I open the room up for questions, you can also come off mute and ask questions. So hopefully that works for y'all. Um, so let me just share my screen and just so you know. There's no information on the slides that I'm going to show. It's just going to be a marker for us to kind of guide our conversation. So uh, here we go. I'm sharing my screen. Hope everyone can see that. Hope it's big enough. Um, so we're really talking about how to customize your application. Um, and there's many places to your application. Of course, there's the personal statement. There's also um, optional essays, there's diversity statements, all of that. And, um, you know, we get questions on how to, how do I bring myself out better for in those um, essays and all of that. So um, this is kind of your, your guiding three principles when you look at your application. Um, one second here. Uh, Yo, I am okay. First off, um, a lot of these um, essays that uh, the schools are asking you to write, um, majority of them will ask for a personal statement. A majority of them will ask for a personal statement. Um, oh, sorry, not a personal statement, a diversity statement. So those two are pretty well known across the board. Um, and, you know, we have the outside unplugged has a lot of videos published on um, how to write those. I have those. Um, but the the bigger questions come when they when we get to like the optional essays um, as where it might be kind of a, a curveball prompt. Um, also, those of you who are applying to more than just a JD program, like a JD MBA program or an LLM program, something like that, they will always ask for, a majority of times will ask for an extra essay. Um, and I think one of the biggest um, mistakes that I see people make is that we don't really know what the uh, prompt is asking for. Um, for example, I had a, I was working with a student who, um, was like, oh, I need to write this optional essay. And I wrote, I wrote a draft. Can you take a look? And I was looking at the prompt and I was like, well, first off, uh, the, the prompt is fairly broad. Um, something like, uh, tell us why you're applying to this program. 
right? And it was for um, specifically an LLM, LLM JD program. Um, and the, the question in my mind was, are they referring to how you would be in addition to the program and what perspectives you'll bring? Or are they asking how this program will help you in your legal career? The prompt is so broad that we don't actually know. So the solution to that, and you may encounter a lot of these prompts, is um, you might need to actually reach out to admissions of that school. Uh, admissions usually has either an email alias, a phone number that you can contact during hours, um, and they should be actually be able to help you answer that question. Um, that student went actually we really want to know how this program is going to help you in the legal career that you want. So tell us why this program is important for you. For the, for the legal career that you're looking to get into. That's a different um, mindset than saying, this is what I'm gonna bring to the program. So really knowing what the prompt is asking is gonna help you better frame the story that you're trying to tell. Um, and a lot of times, so the personal statement, diversity statement, they're fairly broad and we have a very good idea of what we need to write. Those optional essays might be somewhere where you need to do the due diligence of asking admissions what they are looking for. Um, a second point, pick the right topic for you. This is really a, um, broader conversation on topic. And I believe there's at least one if not two or three um, videos on YouTube or podcasts um, on that unplugged channel um, that talks about, and I'm, I talk about it as well, that talks about picking the right topic. Um, the story that you think that you need to tell is might be different than the story that you need to tell. So kind of understanding what topic is right, um, what topic is appropriate is a process. Um, it's a couple iterations of you writing a draft and saying, actually, this topic that I thought was a good one might not be what's appropriate here. Um, and kind of going through the motions of that to figure it out and, and kind of hone in on what the right topic is. Um, there's different ways to filter a topic. Um, if you want to get a whole spiel on it. There's a video on YouTube. I believe it's about an hour long. So um, really take a look at that video. Um, but, you know, times when we start thinking about our essays, we start thinking with the hook, right? Oh, that's a really interesting hook to start my personal statement. Well, if you're never going to refer back to that hook, in, in the rest of your essay, is it really the right story to begin with? Um, that's something to think about. Um, also, don't try to think that, oh, this is what admissions is looking for. Admissions is looking for a broad spectrum of students. And if, you know, I've interviewed um, admissions officers this past year, um, and nobody had one answer this we're looking in a diversity statement, um, you know, they're, they are accepting a wide variety of people with a wide variety of experience. So don't think that they're looking for a specific kind of narrative or a spe specific kind of experience or a specific kind of essay. Um, write story that needs to be told to explain the why law school or why a legal career. Um, and I think that would set you action. Lastly, third point, um, don't name drop the school. And, and this is one of those where um, when students start off applying uh, and they write their first draft, they always have that whole um, to be part of your um, prestigious institution, school name X, Y, and Z. Um, and I'm sure some of you have that in essence. Um, 
when I say don't name drop, it doesn't mean you can't talk about the school. Um, however, we want to be very strategic about how you're, how you're tailoring you say to that school. So I don't believe that putting a school's name into your essay is enough if that's if you're trying to appeal to admissions that you've done your research and you think that school's a right fit for you. If you are just name dropping the school, that is not enough. Um, I think you, if you want to go in that direction of putting the school's name in or a specific program or a specific professor, um, you need to do the due diligence and say, hey, this is where I'm going. And therefore I would like to be part of this community and be a little bit more specific about how you're going to integrate, how you're going to be a value add in that community. Um, I think it's a, it's a dangerous technique to just name drop a school and have 14 different essays with different school names in it. Every year we hear admissions officers say, I got a, I got an essay with a different school's name in it. And that, that might not kill your chances of going to that school, but I don't think anyone needs the stress of thinking, oh my gosh, I sent the wrong essay to the wrong school. So um, if you're going to name drop a school, don't even do it. Just write a generic essay um, that you can send to multiple schools. And if there's a top school out there that you're like, this is my dream, this is where I want to go, this is where I want to be, then maybe customize that one or two essays. But beyond that, that I don't think that's where your time and energy should be going. Um, so that is really it for my spiel of, you know, your kind of how to make that application stronger, more customized to who you are. Um, I would love to open the floor up to questions. If I can find the chat box here, um, feel free to drop any questions in the chat. Um, if you want to come off mute and ask a question, happy to answer any questions around applications, essays, you know, letters of rec, timing, any of that. We have quite a group today. Can I go ahead and come off mute or however it makes you feel comfortable? Awesome. Hi, Aika. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate all of your sessions and have attended a few in the past. Um, so it's very nice to see you again. Um, my question specifically is is that I was wondering if you can talk more about how um, within different, one thing that I'm struggling with is that writing my different essays, I, in my personal case, I know that I wanna go to law school to work on essentially reforming the mental health system um, through using the legal field. And so I do mention sort of my, um, you know, my professional work in that space and what drew that interest, but I was wondering because that's such a huge part of why I want to go to law school. It is also relevant, um, not just in my professional life, but also in my personal life and in my extracurriculars. And I'm worried that I'll come off as someone who, you know, only cares about, you know, doing mental health work and nothing else, because that's the general uh, trend or theme that you can see throughout my application. And I don't know if that's a strength or if that would hurt me and make me seem horribly uninteresting. Of course, I'm not writing the same essay over and over. Um, and I talk about whether it's my personal example, you know, volunteer work that I did, professional work that I did, you know, policies that I've worked on. But I just would love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I think um, those of us who are in a certain field and who, who live and breathe that field, uh, I feel you, Kenna. I, li I live and breathe in, in a very different field, but um, we can feel like, oh, yeah, this might be boring. Um, however, I think I'm like, oh my gosh, tell me more. What, like, tell me what's going on. You know, there's so much information that you have as a person. And 
and I feel like when you get to writing your essays, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't fit all the information that I want to fit into an essay um, in the two pages that are given for a personal statement or the one and a half for diversity or the 500 words in an optional essay. Like you're going to run out of space. Um, so I think really organizing what you want your application to say as a whole is probably key for your application and then piece together the, so that application is a pie right and then you know you have that personal statement piece what are you going to talk about there with regards to let's say your experience in the mental health field and then um you know maybe in the diversity statement like a different take of that mental health experience um and then if there's an optional essay you know, some schools have optional essays that ask specifically, why are you applying to the school? That can be a very targeted essay around, you know, saying like, there's this program that you guys have. And I think, you know, my experience, I can bring a lot to it, but I'm going to learn X, Y, and Z, and I can be that, that cross point. So I, I think there's different ways to frame the essays, um, even though you may be talking about a similar meta topic, um, but the different takes in the essays can show a different side of who you are. Um, and, and that's ultimately what you wanna get across with the essays is all admissions officers have said um, publicly on videos that they are looking to understand who you are as a person. What makes you tick? How do you think? Um, are you, you know, if you think of something, do you take action? Stuff like that. So really you want to make sure you're highlighting different things about yourself, but it can all be related in this whole conversation about mental health that you're talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely. And I know there's a bunch of people who are direct messaging me questions. If you could put it in, um, in, in the chat for everyone, um, what you'll find in these sessions is a lot of people have very similar questions. So um, I would encourage you to be brave and kind of put them in the public chat, but I will go, go ahead and answer some of these questions. So um, the recording of the session, I believe they will go up on YouTube in a couple weeks. So keep an eye out for that. Um, can you replace LSAT scores after applying? Um, that would depend on the school. So I would really ask admissions. Some schools, once they receive your application, um, may look at your, your application right away and have a decision within six weeks to eight weeks, right? So if your score isn't coming out until another eight weeks, you're kind of out, <laughs> out of luck in terms of they, they've already taken a look at your application, right? So you may want to talk to your school and that may be a reason to hold back at your application until a certain date. Um, but I can't give you a general answer on that. Um, Vanessa, you asked for letters of rec. Is it bad that it, if it's only one employer who are who is writing um, non-traditional student, don't have any communication with my professors, I, and I don't think they would remember me. Okay, so Vanessa, I don't know how long you've been outside of school. Um, a good number of schools have said that if you are five years or out from uh, undergrad, they will um, put the same weight um, in employer uh, letters of rec as professors because they understand that you know professors retire, you might not have a relationship with a professor anymore, X, Y, and Z. Um, it would be great if you had uh, a, a letter from your professor, but if you don't think it's going to be as strong as your employers, um, then I, I would say that's a, that's a call that you can make. And I think that's a great call that you can make. Um, you know, I'm about six years out from undergrad and definitely kept up a uh, relationship with a professor where when I graduated, I was like, I know one day you're going to write a letter of rec for me. Um, so, you know, I've kept that communication up with a professor, but I understand it's really hard to do that. And maybe you didn't connect with the professor. Um, and, and that's all right. So, um, if your employer can write a really, really strong letter of rec, I think that's great. Having um, maybe two people from the employer, or if you had multiple employers, having a letter of rec from two separate employers would be great as well. Um, so, so there's different ways to get around it. Um, if you are teetering on that 
um, you've been out of school for maybe three years or less and you're saying that, maybe you wanna reach out to admissions and add, clarify that piece. Um, but admissions are very understanding of not, and, and they're very used to non-traditional students coming in um, and, and applying. So they should be very ready with an answer for that. Um, would you say that one letter of recommendation is sufficient or do they generally prefer two? Um, so if you go into LSAC and you start your, your application, um, and when you start adding schools, they'll tell you um, one letter, two letter, three letters. Um, the I'm not sure which schools you're looking at. I've generally seen two letters um, and then an optional third if you want to. Um, I think if they're giving you the option of one or two, I would go with two because, so just a little side spiel about letters of recs. If you were asking um, either your professor, employer, someone, hey, can you write a letter of rec for me? And they say, yes, and that's all you said, I think that's a missed opportunity. Like when I was answering Kenna's question about your application as a whole, your letter of rec is another piece of the pie. And you really want to direct your uh, writers to write, to fill in a gap that maybe you can't fill in your application. For example, um, if you have a not so great GPA going in, but you you had a great experience with the professor and you showed up well to that class and you say, that's actually how I can show up um, at law school. And then to that professor, you really should be saying, hey, I'm applying to law school. I don't have the best GPA, but I felt like I was the best student I could be at your in your class. Can you write a letter of rec that reflects how I showed up in that class? I feel, and, and then, you know, if you have it, um, have, you know, writing samples that you did during the class, significant projects that you did during the class, um, and, and, you know, kind of supplement that uh, ask and say, here are the examples of my work that I did during your class, just to jog your memory. And that can really fill that gap. It can't boost your GPA, but it can give insight to say, hey, maybe overall GPA wasn't great, but this person shows up very strongly in class. And they, maybe there's other factors that are going into that GPA, but that letter of rec can really help you elevate that. So when I see a question about, should I just send in one or two? I think that's an op opportunity to fill in any gaps that you may have in your application. Maybe you don't have gaps and, and that would be great. Um, but if you feel like you do, then I think the letter of recs can help you boost your application in different places where you can't necessarily. Um, for those who do not have professional experience that relates to law school, how would you recommend strengthening your personal statement to make yourself stand out? Um, so I think that would, Alina, that's a great question. Um, when you don't have professional experience, you can, um, you have four years of school that you have experienced. And these past four years <laughs> has been an interesting four years. And I think you can refer back to any internships you've had, any interesting classes you've had, um, any pivotal moment in your life maybe that um, kind of changed the perspective for you. Um, you've made the decision to go to law school as a young adult um, and, to kind of talk about what got you to that decision would be um, an interesting essay. Um, so I think that's kind of where you can start. Um, also kind of what, whenever I think about personal statements, um, admissions officers always say, hey, we wanna know about, more about you. And I think that's hard in terms of a life event sort of, uh, mindset and that's where a lot of people go to right um i had a legal setback somewhere or my family was involved with the law or um you know i i was involved with the law you know that that could be a topic but a lot of people think in that way um i would love for you to think a little bit outside of the box and say um for example what do you want admissions to know about you are you detail oriented are you driven can you 
make your own goals. And once you achieve, achieve them, move the goalpost for yourself and challenge yourself more. Are you a self challenger? You know, stuff like that, that could be a lot more interesting than saying, well, I took this class and it made me really think about, um, the legal system in America, and therefore I'm pursuing a law law degree. Not a bad essay, but it could be a little bit more interesting. Chantal, do you think it's more important to turn in your application sooner or wait for a better LSAT score, turn in your application later in the process? Um, In general, this is very general, so um, it depends, but uh, I take Steve's Uh, general advice that a better LSAT score is probably better. So um, I would wait for, if you know for sure you can get a better LSAT score, wait for that LSAT score. Um, My personal statement includes aspects of a diversity statement, being an underrepresented minority, various obstacles face, uh, should I write a diversity statement? Okay, so one point about diversity statements the law schools do not uh, limit diversity statements to race, gender, uh, religion. They also say any interesting work experience. So they've opened the door to a lot of things in terms of a diversity. If you have a diverse perspective, um, I think it is valid as a diversity statement. Now, I would actually... Asia, for you, take a real good look at your personal statement and um, kind of count out what are the things that you are talking about, like the different topics that are in your essay. I think um, if you count, you may have three or four things that you're talking about in your essay. Um, And I think for a personal statement that is two pages um, or a little bit over two pages, you should have one or two. So if the one or two is including the um, being part of an underrepresented minority. I think you can swing it as a personal statement. If you're more comfortable swinging it as a diversity statement, I think that's fine as well. Um, Many times what you'll find is that people start off writing a personal statement and a diversity statement and it switches. So where we end up is that diversity statement turns into a a personal statement and the personal statement that we started off with turns into a diversity. So be flexible in that. Um, But I think write out what you want to write out. Write out that essay. You can always piece out um, what might be for a diversity statement and what might be for a personal. So kind of split that out. Um, So don't I say, don't be confined in the categories, write out all the things that you want to say and then split it out. Jacob, uh, you're a Canadian law school applicant. And in regards to letters of recommendations, do you know if the same amount of weight is put behind it as an American school? I actually don't have that answer for you, Jacob. And I would actually go ahead and call or reach out to admissions to, to um, the schools that you are applying to Um, And even in American law schools, letters of rec are given different weights across schools. So um, if you're really interested in the answer to that question, I would reach out. I'm wondering if you're asking that because um, you you feel like maybe you don't have strong letters of rec or you might not have the people that you want writing your letters of rec. yeah, uh, I, I would really ask the school, um, you really do want strong letters of rec. Um, they can turn a, a maybe into a yes um, if they show up right, and they can turn a maybe into a no if they don't show up right. So I would, I, I would take some time to, to think about what you're doing with the letters of rec. Um, Emma, Tough go around with the LSAT this past year. Find out, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh no, yeah, and the Wi-Fi stuff. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, okay, so 
Emma, thank you for sharing that information. I appreciate you asking that. And, and I, my heart goes out to you. Um, with regards to the application, I think there is a place to write about that in an addenda, as long as you're not addressing what's happening um, extensively in, let's say, your personal statement or your diversity statement, granted, um, admissions always says we don't want to have question marks at the end of reading your application. So, for example, if they see multiple LSAT scores, I think you are better off um, writing an addenda and you know, uh, explaining what's going on, especially for yours, because of the circumstances, I think you would be better off writing an addenda and, and explaining what went on. Um, if you are planning to take the LSAT again, um, let's say for January, um, I would probably wait for that score to come out and then apply. You are still right smack in the middle of the application cycle. So I think, I don't think you're doing yourself a dis disservice by waiting until January, um, but also address the the other times and what, what was going on. Thank you for sharing, Emma. Um, yeah, so when is the best time to purchase cast? Um, I, if you're, if you haven't purchased cast yet and you're applying by December 31st, I think it would do you well to uh, purchase. Um, I am not LSAC, so, or nor sponsored by LSAC. So uh, that is not, uh, you know, that's not motivated anything else besides timeline. Um, if you don't open up your cast, you can't um, turn in your transcript, which um, because we are in the busy season and school have started um, and you know that's uh, school will be out mid-December um, at the latest I think um, you do want to get your transcripts in ASAP they can take up to I think a month to get into CAS um, and depending on when you do it it will take longer so I would buy it first thing you should do Layla is to get the uh get your um transcript in um Chantal do you think it's important to tailor your personal statement to a specific school yeah um Chantal I think in general um and this is my personal opinion you should have a general essay um that's out there um and then for maybe your school that's your top, top choice, or your, there's a specific program that you're like, if I get in here, that would be like my dreams come true. I think that is where um, you can bring in a little bit of personalization and customization of like, this is why I'm pursuing this specific program. You know, I think this is a great fit, X, Y, and Z. Um, warning, do not kind of swallow brochure and regurgitate it. We see a lot of that. Um, no need to talk about the beautiful campus, you know, stuff. like that's a lot of filler. Um, really get to the meat of why you're drawn to that program, why you're drawn to that school. Um, and maybe you can do one or two of those, but that, that takes a lot of research and that takes a lot of connection. Um, you don't want to name drop being like, hey, I want to take this class with this professor. That's widely available information on the um, on the internet, right? So the people who have done it well have reached out to admissions, have reached out to specific departments and said and and have had multiple conversations with admissions, um, have had conversations with a professor and say, hey, you know, like in my conversation with Professor X, Y, and Z, um, I, I realized that this is the route I want to go. And therefore, um, I am pursuing this program or something like that. Um, so it takes a lot more work than just writing it. Um, so I, I think that's something that you should keep in mind when you, when you talk about um, customizing your personal statement. 
Um, oh, okay, Jacob. Thanks for uh, the additional information. Um, question about letters of rec. Can you see it? So they do not require it for regular applicants. Don't, uh, don't want to rush my reference writers in Canada. They do not use cast. Okay, so I think it would be really crappy of a school to if they said it's not required, but they gave it a weight that would change to the point where it would change and accept to like they're they're going to say oh this person didn't have a letter of rec therefore even though it was like um not required um because this person didn't have a letter of rec we're, we're not going to get give them an acceptance i think that that's not great um so that's my two cents out there if there's any sort of language that says it's not required but highly recommended i think you should have it um beyond that i can't answer that question much further um cool uh kenna when is the site when in the cycle should you purchase cast and request transcript if you're thinking of applying to law school september 22 uh okay um i say the applications for the the uh next year will not open up until um probably after their application for 21 closes. So, and that application cycle has gotten longer over the course of COVID because everyone's online. Um, timelines have shortened in terms of making decisions and making action. Um, where So many times you'll see applications open until May, um, for a July start or an August start, right? So really you wanna be, um, I say have that cast open, your transcript, unless you are still in school, your transcript is not gonna change. If you're out of school for a couple of years, your transcript isn't gonna change. So go ahead and open up CAS um, and then have that transcript in. You can have uh, professors, employers turn in letters of rec early, um, I had mine turned in during the summer. Um, so, and they just sit in your application. So, um, you know, not, that's fine. Um, I, it's also your comfort in opening up an application. Some people find that to be um, adding anxiety to their, to their life. So if you're like, I, if you're a person who's like, I need all my ducks in a row before I start opening up CAS, that's fine. Um, but I think just know that there are pieces that take a little bit of a process. Letters of rec also is a little bit of a process where you have to enter information for your writers and LSAC will trigger an email to your letter of rec writers and then they have to upload the, the letter. So it is a process, it's not immediate. Um, so I would really kind of um, keep that in mind um, when you're applying. Um, and Mike, I know you sent a direct message. Uh, so the notes, what I'm sharing here is all that we kind of went over today. So um, beyond that, the recording will be up on YouTube, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Good to see you, Mike. Um, cool. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's another question about letters of rec. How long would you say is too long to ask your former professor for a letter of rec? Two years ago, still ner nervous about asking the ones I had good classes with. I also don't want to seem like I'm the only calling them for favor. Okay. I think professors are very used to people coming out of the woodworks four, five, six, ten years later asking for a letter of rec. So don't be embarrassed, number one. Uh, number two, um, I had a professor write a letter of rec for me and I've graduated in 2015. So it's been a while and I don't think anyone's gonna hold that against you. Um, so I, I'm not sure where you may have reservations on it's been too long. Um, they can testify to how you are in a classroom. So I think that's that's a strength if you've been out of school for a bit, and but they can still talk because 
the the question in admissions minds for non-traditional students is going to be how are they going to be in a classroom right and for those students who have been out of school for five plus years that's a bigger question so really you want to alleviate any questions they might have of that so to kind of have a letter of rack that can say, hey, this person is actually great. They brought, they did their homework. They, you know, they spoke up in class. They brought a great perspective. They showed up awesome in class. That's a great testament to have, especially if you've been out of school for a bit. Um, I think uh, if you are, if you've been out of school for a couple of years, but you know, you can reach back out to your professors, I would just really start a conversation and say, hi, how are you doing? Have that conversation. Take them, you know, I I worked in Tokyo for a bit, so I, I, I was out of the country. Um, but every time I came back for the summer um, to visit friends and family, um, I made sure to make an appointment and say, hey, I just want to catch up. Um, and, you know, had coffee, had dinner with a professor and say like, hey, these are the plans. This is what's going on. I'm hoping to apply within the next few years, X, Y, and Z. And, you know, really update that person um, and show them the respectives, you know, and, and I totally understand the whole like, hey, can you like write me a letter? Like that's such an awkward question to go in with, but say, hey, like I'm genuinely interested in what's going on. Tell me about your research. Tell me about the classes that you're teaching. I showed up to a class once because he was like, hey, do you want to, I know you love this class. Did you did you want to like swing by? And I was like, yes, absolutely. So, you know, just kind of have that relationship and you can always build that relationship up. Um, it's hard to let it go down to zero and then bring it up again. So just if you are teetering on that point of like, oh, I don't know if he will remember me, but I showed up well in his class or her, her class, um, I would really try to reach out with an email, um, or say, hey, do you mind if I show up to your office hours, if you can, um, you know, all of that fun stuff. So I would really ask that and, and build up that relationship before, not before, but kind of as you're asking for the letter of rec. Um, Laura, what is the latest month I should apply for the fall 22 um, cycle? Um, I think the December January line is is about as early as it can get. Um, yeah, so I think the latest for you're teetering in the middle of the pack with January um, applications, but I, I've heard and, and this depends on which school you're applying to. So if you're applying to T14, um, you really should have your applications in now um, to be considered early. For the non-T14 schools, um, you know, their, their application cycle is very long. So um, being in the January will be fine. Um, I think beyond that, you may be teetering on that, like, okay, you're, you're competing with 60% of the other people who are applying that cycle. Um, to the November also. So, okay, uh, Laura, if I may double click into your question, you took the November LSAT, don't think you'll be retaking. Great, awesome, great job um, in taking the LSAT and feeling like you that's the score you got um, and you can go with. Um, I think I would finish up the application during, you know, take this Thanksgiving break the first week of December and try to get it in within December. Um, now, if it's a question between the last week of December and the first week of January, I say take that week to perfect the application. But beyond that, I think if you can get it in December, that's great. Um, if if you can get it within January, that's great as well. Um, but I think you're teetering beyond that. I think you would be teetering on the competing with the majority of the applicants. Can I um, insight it's on Yale 250 since my application will have the theme around mental health. I can recommend I choose another topic. I actually, I'm sorry, kind of, I have no idea what you're talking about with the Yale 250. So I don't have any, any advice I can give there. Um, 
do we send our letters to you so that you can check them? Billy, can you give me some context there? I'm not understanding the question. Well, I mean, just so that, you know, if you wanted to look over the, just going by each individual letter to see what, uh, what's good about it and what's not, or what needs improvement. All right, and this is the letters of rack, right? Uh, yeah, the first one that is perfect. Okay, um, I'm sorry, there's a lot of noise. So, uh, oh, I'm a, I'm a okay, so what I understand, so two, two comments on that. If you are, I do not do, um, Outside of the LSAT class, I do not do personal readings of, of you know, uh, personal statements and all of that outside of LSAT Unplugged class. So if you would like to get personal feedback, um, you would need to join LSAT Unplugged courses. Um, letters of Rec, it, it, and I'm hoping that that's where you're asking if you can send them in and get them checked. So Letters of Rec um, in LSAC, in the CAS system there is a place where you can check that you are okay to not take a look at the letter before it gets sent um there's differing opinions on why you would or wouldn't check that i generally say don't check that box or, or sorry check the box to say that you've waived your right to see the letter um for two different reasons um, one is because whoever's writing the letter, if they know that you will be looking at the letter, um, they're writing for two different readers. So they may, they may censor themselves to say, oh, that's not a good thing to say in this letter, especially if Ayaka is looking at them, right? Or um, they may decide to omit things. Um, the other is that there's some sort of integrity about people who, who look at your application and say, oh, okay, this person didn't take a look at this, this letter. So they don't know what's being writ written here. Um, that's why you really want to be very confident that the person that's writing your letter is going to write a good letter for you. Um, but I think it is better to waive that right, um, but be very confident that the letter is going to be strong. Um, so those are my two cents. Um, Jamie, taking the FAB LSAT, um, I think that would be kind of the middle of the pack in terms of where the population is in terms of applying. Um, the application cycle has become longer, um, no doubt. So um, you know, there's a, a good number of people who are applying in the spring. Um, so I don't think it's late, like too late, but you are competing with a lot of people who are turning in applications at a similar time. Um, and maybe half the seats at that law school will be filled. Um, and it also depends on what school you're applying to. So if you're applying for a T14, yeah, probably a little bit late for that cycle, uh, but not, you know, no hope is lost. But if you're looking at um, maybe a smaller school, probably, um, you, you know, it's probably not too late at all. And you can really still turn in a strong application and you have a great, great chance of going to law school. Well, I've talked a lot, but um, any last questions, lingering questions that we you may have, um, just know that this class hopefully will be up on YouTube soon. Um, also, LSAT Unplugged, I teach a class every Wednesdays. Those get uploaded um, to YouTube as well, just at a later timeline, but um, those go to... Uh, go to YouTube and the podcast. Billy, we're not doing um, personal statement critiques here in this class right now. We do, I do run them in the um, LSAT Unplugged course. The next one is gonna be in mid-December, so we'll do that. Um, yeah, so we do do that 
um, mid-December. We, we have quite a few essays lined up, but hopefully we can get yours in as well if you decide to join the course. Um, you know, it, and it's a lot of hot seat coaching, um, not just from me, but from peers as well. So it's a great way to kind of get a perspective on your essay because, and, and this is something that I said in my last class, um, I think last Wednesday, is getting someone like me to read your essay is one thing, but also it is great to hear feedback from multiple people who who are listening or reading your essay at the same time. Not because, you know, we're all experts or all of that, but because admissions officers come from all walks of life as all of us do. So you actually can't dictate who is reading your essay. They may look like you, they may not, they may have a similar interest as you, they may not. Um, they may have a similar background as you, they may not. And you wanna make sure that your essay is speaking to, in a way that is understandable to all people, but also um, if, you know, that is understandable to all people, but also can communicate the story that it, where it's not overcomplicated. And, and these, this is for people, for my people out there who have had careers and who have had a couple years of a career under their belt. It's really hard to kind of put um, all of that into two pages. Your life into two pages is insane. Um, and so you want to make sure that the language you're using, the style that you're using, the story that you're telling is palpable to a majority of people. And so, you know, people who are really used to reading essays, like me, um, I have a certain perspective in how written should, uh, how an essay should be written, but also people who are just coming by to read that essay, they also have a valid point in saying, hey, like I understood none of that because of the jargon or because of this thing that you're talking about that I'm not 100% familiar with, so I didn't understand it. You know, those are the things that can really alter how we write our essay. So really um, having multiple people look at your essay is great. Um, LSAT Unplugged Admin, can we get a link to the LSAT Unplugged course? Um, dropped in the chat, please. Um, I, I think there's a, a good interest out there. So that would be great. Uh, Sandra, can you suggest a good LSAT course or how to make a good study schedule for yourself? Um, so LSAT Unplugged is great. They have um, some great classes that you can take on a weekly basis. Every week there's classes, there's uh, study groups, there's TAs out there. Um, there's also a good slew of information out there that is available for free um, that you can utilize for your studying. I think a good study schedule, I believe Steve has some on his uh, intro, like the information about LSAT Unplugged. There's some free, I think, uh, study schedules that are out there um, that can help you kind of frame how you wanna study. Um, Sandra, I would love to know what you're looking to do um, in what time frame, um, and maybe I can give you maybe two cents about it. But um, yeah, th there's some resources out there. Um, some work for some people, some don't work for others. So really, it takes a little bit to find what what can be useful to you. All right, we're almost at the top of the hour. Last minute questions, anyone? I'm looking for 23 and three. I'm looking for 20, what does, sorry, Sandra, you gotta, what does that mean? <laughs> 23 and two. Um, Billy, when I say not to name drop, um, for people who write their essays at the very, in their very last conclusion, they say, I would love to attend your prestigious uh, institution, um, XYZ University, um, and that's it. Like, that's, that's not helpful for anyone to have that in your essay. So uh, I say don't name drop the school. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, Sandra. Um, so 2023 entry into law school, so you're applying next fall. Um, you have a lot of time and 
um, it depends on where you're starting. So I think if you, you know, of course there's always the, the internet will tell you a lot of things. Um, I do suggest the power score books, uh, not sponsored. Um, but having a cohort of people who are applying in the same timeline ish, um, studying in the same timeline ish would be great. And that's what I found at LSAT Unplugged. Um, the, the course they're, they're always running courses for every level of person. So finding the right group of people and kind of going to the courses and then kind of studying on your own and having time to study with a study group, that's also important. So I believe there's schedules on Outside Unplugged if that works for you. Um, there's, you know, three month schedules, six month schedules, all of that um, out there. And then kind of supplement that with study group, with courses, um, whether that's through PowerScore, Seven Sage, uh, Alpha Unplugged, I think that should help you. Emma, I think four pages long. Um, I've, I know school, there's some schools out there who allow up to four pages. I think it's long. Um, and two pages is probably the average. I would really take a look at each school, what they're asking for, if they say no more than two pages, and if you write two, two and a half pages, you're out. So really look at, look at what the school's asking for. In general, I say have the two page personal statement. And if you get two and a half pages, great. You can, you can have those like paragraphs that you're like, oh, I had to cut it for space, but I really want to put it in. Um, and then keep, you know, you can have that as an option, but really keep the two and a half pages. Even reading, I read a lot of personal statements. Reading a three page personal statement is long. Um, I'm not keeping the information from the beginning and it's, I'm like, okay, I'm done by two pages and a half. So keep that in mind. <laughs> spills over by a paragraph, spills over by a paragraph. It doesn't meet two pages, but it spills over. By, you gotta figure out where to cut, you know, the personal statement, I think um, my theory in how to write a personal statement is your first draft. Don't think about that page limit. My first draft of my personal statement was six pages long. The game is to figure out where to cut. You're going to have to cut some stories that you think are really important. You're going to need to cut a lot that you're like, oh, I wish I could tell this. You're it's a cutting game. So write all the things that you want to write about, write about, you know, your childhood, your, what your dreams are, you know, all of those things, everything that you think needs to be written out. That should be six to 10 pages, depending on the person you are. And then we'll go in, you should go in and cut, 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 and then say, okay, I can use this for my diversity statement. I can use this in my optional essay. This is my personal statement. And that should really set you up well. Um, Taking the last questions here, Vanessa, addendum regarding low GPA, what would you suggest a good way to end it? I read mine and I feel like I might leave them questioning. I don't want to read. Okay, so I think for an addenda, uh, I think the best way to end an addenda is to say, hey, these are the things that went wrong, right? I've learned to overcome those things via personal growth, uh, self-reflection, all of those good things. And then um, and then kind of go into how you've overcome them, therefore they're not a problem anymore. I think that's a good way to good way to end it. So let's say for example, if in your low GPA it was like you had a lot of anxiety, you you dealt with mental um, mental health issues, for example, um, then you can say, hey, I've worked on myself, I've gone to therapy, and I have learned to um, deal with my triggers, and I am better able to navigate the landscape, and therefore, it has not been a problem since. And that's a great way to end it, rather than saying, here's my problems, right? So I think that would be a great way to end it. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. 
and feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.